one morning back in 1977, I was working really hard to turn in an absolutely perfect performance as a brand newly minted pilot. I was number three on the pecking order in this Boeing 727. We had a captain, a first officer, a second officer, that was me. It was Braniff International and we were on a routine flight from Chicago's O'Hare to Houston Intercontinental Airport. Beautiful clear blue sky day. We were climbing through 10,000 feet when we realized we had a problem. This was not an emergency. It was not a major emergency of any sort. Our tail skid had failed to retract. It's just a little thing back there in the back, which literally does what it would, it's described as. It would skid if you over-rotated the airplane. And there's no real big problem here, except that we'll lose about 2% of our fuel burn because it's hanging down in the airstream. But there's one other thing that you've got to do. And that is, you've got to go to the back and turn off a little spigot because there's a little valve right ahead of that location on the bottom of the fuselage where the tail skid is that would be spewing water coming from the drains in the back bathrooms onto that thing. And at minus 45 degrees temperature, at altitude, you start growing a big stalagmite. <laughs> and I tell you, this thing can be about 10 feet long by the time you're two hours in the air, and it's not neighborly to drop something like that into the community as you're making your approach. <laughs> so as the junior guy, it, it falls to me. I, I, I was flying with a wonderful captain this particular day. His name was Harold Mize. We all called him Tiny. Big, barrel-chested guy, way over six feet. Wonderful individual and a great pilot. And he was very laid back. He turned around and said, OK, John, pull out the manual. Tell us what we need to do. So I pulled out the manual, and I saw a couple of fuzzy pictures there about the valves under the sink that I had to turn, well, only one. You've got to be careful because the other one controlled all the potable water for the airplane. It's a morning flight. We've got 144 people, mostly businessmen. And I go to the back of the airplane in my hat and coat. This was back in the days before 9-11 when you could actually leave the cockpit, open the doors, find the valve, turn it. And as I'm walking back, I remember so clearly thinking, that was a perfect performance. This is exactly what I was hired to do. I did it exactly right until the lead flight attendant grabbed me by the shoulder and said, John, we don't have any water. <laughs> I, I had just succeeded in identifying the wrong valve and dumping 200 gallons of potable water over middle Illinois. Now, I probably contributed to the irrigation of some of the crops down there, but my passengers were not amused. <laughs> no coffee, no tea, six crew members and 144 disgruntled passengers, and I got on the PA to make the explanation, but it was embarrassing. Now, Tiny was very nice about it. He turned around and said, hey, it was probably difficult to understand those pictures in the book. But both he and I knew that I had just failed utterly in my number one responsibility as a young flight officer at Braniff, which was to be perfect absolutely perfect 100% of the time. And I had just proven that they had hired less than the perfect pilot that they thought they had hired and trained. Very, very embarrassing. Fortunately, not a firing offense. But in the next couple of weeks, as I was kicking myself around the block, and I did, uh, having made this mistake, <laughs> embarrassing my crew and myself, there were a couple of questions that started eating at the back of my mind. And these were embarrassing questions because these were not the sort of they sounded like excuses. They were not the sort of thing that somebody like me with a military background should be engaging in, right? Because with a military background, you're used to squaring your shoulders when you make a mistake and say, no excuse, sir. And one of the questions was exactly what Tiny had kind of indicated when he said, you know, maybe the manual, maybe it could have been written better. Maybe it was slightly contributory to my mistake because the pictures were pretty fuzzy. It was hard to discern which side the valves were on. And there was another one, and that was maybe Tiny should have said, John, sit on your hands for a few minutes. It's not an emergency. Don't run to the back until you're absolutely sure. Maybe you want to take the book with you. But there was a third one. And this really bothered me because I was at the start of what I expected to be a 30 to 35-year career as an airline pilot. Was I really supposed to be absolutely perfect 100% of the time? Every decision I made, every switch I threw, every entry in the logbook, everything I did? My God, is that even possible? That was really eating at me, along with the fact, of course, that it was embarrassing that I was even asking myself these questions because I was supposed to be perfect. Why is this important? I think this is important because all of us, no matter whether we want to admit it or not, all of us have spent an awful lot of time in our lives and even more so in some professions, wondering why we're not measuring up. Everybody else seems to be getting it right, but we keep making mistakes. Everybody 
makes mistakes. And this is the dirty little secret. While it looks like you're the only one who is, because what do we always do when we make a mistake? It's us, right? It's not them. It's us. They're perfect. No, they're not. There is no carbon-based human being out there in any industry, in any profession, any walk of life, including just being nicely retired or having fun or whatever it is you're doing, who does not make mistakes. And the reason why is that, and this is a startling development, but we've learned in aviation especially, but also in nuclear power generation and other high-risk industries, that human beings cannot be perpetually perfect. Now, we can be perfect part of the time. Matter of fact, some of us can actually manage to be perfect for a whole career, but here is the kicker. None of us has the ability to look somebody else in the eye and say, I promise you that I am going to be absolutely perfect in my execution of whatever it is I'm going to do for the next period of time. 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 years, whatever. We can't say that honestly. So where does that leave us? Well, we, we know the extremes. The extreme over here is the one we've always had, which is we have to have perfect performance from human beings 100% of the time. And over here is the laissez-faire attitude of, hey, dude, pff, things happen. We, we don't want that attitude in the operating room. <laughs> and we sure don't want it in the cockpits, and we don't want it in the, in the control room of a nuclear power plant. Uh, so where is the balance point in all this? The balance point is actually a new way of looking at things, because we have always had this paradigm. I, you know, it didn't just start with 1966 and Star Trek with Captain Kirk, played wonderfully by Bill Shatner, who was the progenitor of that wonderful Hollywood organization known as Overactors Anonymous. Um, <laughs> But he was the perfect paradigm, wasn't he? Because he was omnipotent and he was infallible and he was a bloody fraud. I don't mean Bill, I mean the, the character. He was a fraud because none of us can be perpetually perfect. And as I say, we then have this dilemma. Where is the balance point? Here is the balance point. It's where we say, I'm very good at what I do, but I know I'm a human being and I know that there are not I know there are times that I'm not going to hear things right. There are times that I'm not going to interpret it right. I'm going to make mistakes that are purely a result of being human, not a result of being a bad professional or a bad husband who forgets to take out the trash, but just being human. But if I know that, and I'm honest enough to admit it, then I have to say, how can I put a prophylaxis of one sort or another in place? How can I build a structure around my potential for human failure that is going to prevent those failures from metastasizing into a result I don't want? This was the key to aviation safety, and we didn't know it until the mid-'80s. This idea of being able to look at human performance and human failure and say, hey, we got to know how we fail. And guess what? Most of it is inadvertent failure like the three guys at Delta Airlines. You all know Delta, they're the ones that gave us that wonderful phrase, I don't know where I'm gonna go when I die, but I do know I'll change in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Delta's a great airline, but 1987, they had three very highly qualified, wonderful guys taxiing off a takeoff, going up to Salt Lake City. They crashed the airplane on takeoff and killed 17 people because they had forgotten to put the flaps in the right position. Those are the big movable panels on the back of the wing and the drooping panels on the front. They forgot, even though all three of them read the checklist and responded 15-15 green when they were 0-0 and there had never been a green light. How does this happen? Well, nobody was on drugs, nobody was drunk, nobody was unqualified. They just happened to be carbon-based human beings. Old Star Trek term, forgive me. The thing is, we have to be serious about this. And in aviation, we finally realized we have to build a system. Well, what's the system we're going to build? First, we're going to fire Captain Kirk. We're going to look at that captain and say, hey, dude, <laughs> we're on to you. You're not perfect. So if you don't create a team, if you don't have it to where your co-pilot and your flight engineer can speak to you, you know, don't give us this one, I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Boy, did I hear that a few times. If you can't create that environment of a team, a collegial interactive team in which nobody would have any hesitation to speak up if they saw, heard, felt, or even intuited that something is wrong, then you're not going to fly for us because we can't trust you to be perpetually perfect no matter how well we trained you, no matter how good you are. This is why you can go to the airport this day and time and get on a jetliner and get to the other end with almost a, in, in, an infinitesimal, is a word I'm trying to pull out of my mouth, an infinitesimal possibility of being hurt. We'll get you there okay. Not well fed, not well treated, but okay. <laughs> That's another lecture for another day. Tradition? 
It's a moral failure to make a mistake. No, the reality is next time this happens to you individually, professionally, and you're kicking yourself around the block, stop and think, hey, I'm already ahead of the game because I realize this. I've got a message from the underlying system that I can use to not only assuage my feelings of inadequacy, but to know that everybody else is the same way. My strength is knowing how to apply that, how to build a system around me. I'll give you an example. My wife is absolutely incredible. She's a nurse. She's a, a, an author and lecturer. She's incredible in knowing the calendar for the next year. She can remember everything on that calendar without looking, and my schedule as well. I am exactly the opposite. I can't remember what I'm doing next Monday. I have to use a calendar, an electronic one, but that is my methodology of making sure that I don't spend half my life apologizing for missed appointments and missed calls. And that's really the key to this. The next thing, what's next, is knowing ourselves as humans and moving on with the ability to be perfect because not uh, we're going to zero out all our errors, but because we know how to absorb them. Another example. In the U.S. Air Force, I flew an airplane called the Lockheed C-141 for many years. The big, big, beautiful airplane. Well, only a pilot would call it beautiful, all right? <laughs> it was a big, hulking thing with four engines. Flew it for 23 years, as I say, in the regulars and reserve and through two wars. And, and this big bird uh, could carry an awful lot of fuel and an awful lot of people. When I first became an aircraft commander at the tender age of 25, I was taught to be Captain Kirk. I was taught to walk in and tell everybody when, who, how, where, and I'll see you on the ramp. And now, many years later, 1987, a day I want to tell you about, I'm walking in for a trip from Tacoma, Washington, in my Corridor Air Force Base, up to Elmendorf, Alaska, in uh, Anchorage. It's going to be a three-and-a-half-hour trip. It's a training mission. We don't have any cargo. Big, powerful jet, 75,000 pounds of jet fuel, and 30 passengers in the back, no cargo. And as I walk in to talk to my crew, who are all standing around a, a circular table about chest high, I've been retrained, totally retrained. Captain Kirk is not walking into that room anymore. Jean-Luc Picard is, to a certain extent, for those of you who follow on to the next generation. Because my duty is now to bind these people into a human team and create a level of communication that is going to assuage the possibility that I could make a major mistake. And so I start by shaking everybody's hand, looking them in the eye, calling them by first name, exchanging personal information. And as, as I'm going through this, when I get to my number three guy, oh boy, do I have a newbie today. He's 18 years old. He's in a factory fresh flight suit with no insignia. He's an airman basic. I'm a colonel. When I shake his hand, I got two fried eggs looking back at me. <laughs> this, guy wants to, this guy wants me to talk to anybody but him. He's scared to death of me. And I realize if I'm going to bind him into this team, I'm going to have to work hard on it. So I continue on around the table. Co-pilot, I flew with this guy in Vietnam. This fellow's got ice water in his veins. If a wing came off and we were spiraling down to our desk, guaranteed he'd ask for coffee with cream on the way down. <laughs> Absolutely imperturbable. So we get ready to finish this part of the briefing. I do the who, what, where, when, how, and why. And normally most everybody else in the old days would have just walked out to the airplane. Now I've been taught to do one other thing, to step back and say, guys, hold on for a second. Those of you who've flown with me have heard this spiel, and you know that I'm very serious. Those of you who haven't listened up, because I'm dead serious. You are my eyes and my ears, okay? I'm a very good aircraft commander. I've been at this a long time. I don't think I'm going to make a major, serious, possibly deadly mistake today, but there's no way I can look you in the eye and tell you that that's not possible. So, despite my record, despite my intention to do everything right, I need to know that you are locked in with me in such a way that if you saw or felt or intuited or anything that something was amiss or you were unsure of something, I need you to speak up instantaneously. I'm going to go back around the table, look everybody in the eye, and I want a blood oath from you that you can rise to this. And if you can't, no problem. We'll just get you on somebody else's airplane, and, and that's that. No pejorative. So I started around the table. Of course, when I get to my new kid, his thumb is in the air and he's really nodding. <laughs> yes, sir. We get out to the airplane. It's a big windowless environment down there. And normally a new loadmaster would ride down there for three and a half hours. And I, nah, I wasn't going to have that. I brought him up on the flight deck. I said, you're, you're going to ride up here with us. Three and a half hours with a headset on, the button in your finger or uh, under your thumb. I want you to talk to us. There are no dumb questions. The only thing I ask is that you not talk over the air traffic controllers, he said. Yes, sir. He makes all the right noises. 18 years old. I wasn't convinced. I sat down beside him and said, look, I'm not sure you can get past this colonel thing, okay? And he stops me in mid-sentence. I couldn't have done this at age 18 facing a colonel. He says, sir, I got it. It's just like dealing with my big brother. 
<laughs> as long as I show him a modicum of respect, I can tell him anything I think he needs to know. I said, well, that's a bit cheeky, but that's pretty much what I wanted. So I climb into the seat. It's another clear blue sky day. We, uh, we blast off. Again, we don't have any cargo, and we're a very, very powerful jet. So as they turn us back towards Seattle, we're climbing to 17,000. We also call that 17,000. 7,000. That's our clearance limit. Coming through 14,100 feet like an intercontinental missile, climbing so fast. And all of a sudden, I hear a click on my headset, and this timorous little voice that I recognize immediately as my newbie says, uh, pilot, load master, 14,200, 14,300, and I'm thinking, yeah, man, he's speaking up, this is good. Go ahead, load this pilot, 14,400, 14,500, uh, sir, 14,600, I'm probably wrong, 14,700, but I could have sworn 14,800 that they only cleared us to 15,000 feet. I, I looked over at my co-pilot, and he's on it immediately. Seattle Center, Mac 50235, we're clear to 17,000, 17,000, roger, 14,900, 14,950. Finally, the voice of the controller, rather laconic in my memory, comes back. Negative, Mac, you're cleared to 15. Good Lord, pull the power back, push the airplane over. Zero G, everybody out in the back. <laughs> I got 30 floaters back there. One guy had not clicked his seatbelt. His buddy had to reach up and grab him and pull him off the ceiling. I get stopped about 15,300. Heart rate's off the chart. Blood pressure is too, and I'm sneaking back to 15,000 feet, hoping that nobody saw this. And I'm now adrenalized. You know, everything is running in slow motion, and I'm thinking about where I can buy this kid the biggest steak in Anchorage. I look over at my imperturbable friend, and all the blood is drained out of this guy's face. I have never seen this before. And I'm looking at him and wondering why. Finally, I follow his gaze and realize what has kind of caused this. He's looking at the belly of a Boeing 747-200, owned by Northwest Orion, 336 people aboard coming in from Tokyo. We called and checked later. He's at 16,000 feet right over our heads. We would have climbed aggressively into his belly, disassembled both airplanes. You don't survive those. We would have rained passengers and parts all over South Seattle, and it would have been the second worst accident in airline history, and I wouldn't be standing here. Now, it'd be wonderful to be able to tell you, because of my prowess as a commander, I had brought this guy into the loop. Bull. It's because we had some very smart people who had begun to retrain us in the things that we were learning in the aviation industry about human failure and about the fact that the main buttress to human failure is a team. And if you don't have the luxury of a team, at least systems, like my system of using the calendar. See, we can't go to what's next successfully. Whether it's facing the singularity, whether it's facing all sorts of uh, political realignment, we're trying to get, as was uh, stated in a, another wonderful lecture about medicine and where we have to go to have a system, we can't do any of that unless we understand ourselves and our failure modes and how to get past them. But the good news is we can do this so easily. It's just about being honest about who we really are and how we can get to zero impact from any failure that we can't prevent. Thank you so much.